Thank you so much, Dr. Kiran, for inviting me. Uh, I'm very honored and blessed to be part of this uh, lecture series the, that you have started there, ed the second edition of your lecture series. I remember attending some of them in the first series as well on integral education. Um, and uh, when you spoke of this particular topic, uh, you know, a couple of weeks back, about three weeks back, um, I was very happy to know that you've sort of taken on this particular theme on uh, the application of art in the whole uh, integral education and the transformative, to sort of focus on the transformative and healing aspect, uh, healing role of art. So um, the topic that I'm going to take up today is sort of like giving a general overview of what Sri Aurobindo and the mother have spoken of in terms of the significance or the value of art and beauty, the cultivation of a sense of beauty, aesthetic sense in vital education. So what is the role of beauty and art in vital education? So, um, and it may be sort of like a building up on what you might have discussed in your first series as well. Uh, so as we know, vital education is one of the key aspects or the, one of the, you know, the, the five-fold education in integral education that mother has spoken of. Um, vital education is a very significant, a very key aspect of that. And uh, in fact, mother has also said somewhere that this is also one aspect of education that probably has been given the least importance simply because it is so difficult to understand what really is vital education. And she's gone into describing what the reasons for that might be. Now, before we go to what vital education is, and I'll just touch upon that very briefly. Um, let's just spend a minute or so talking about what vital is in the whole scheme of integral education or uh, the integral um, understanding of the being. So vital is that life energy, that life plane, that part of the being which is concerned mostly with the life energy. So this is the seat of all the feelings, the emotions, the desires, the sensations, the, um, you know, the cravings, desires, even it's also the seat of will. This is also the seat of ego in that sense. Um, you know, the, what we call simply as egoistic feeling of pride, um, feelings of fear, uh, likes, dislikes, attractions, repulsions, um, cravings, desires. So vital is uh, certainly emotions. So vital is that part of the being. And educating or training of this part of the being becomes very significant for a complete overall integral education, integral transformation of the outer being. Um, now, what is this vital education? Now, the mother has spoken of um, that why this vital education becomes difficult to uh, comprehend and difficult to actually fully implement is because most people don't give importance to understanding what vital is and how it can be educated. Um, and she said this because she's spoken of once in her writings on education, uh, she spoke of vital as a despotic and exacting, exacting tyrant. Vital is that part of the being which tries to master, which tries to become the dominator, the dominating part of the being. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why most people um, or most uh, thinkers on education even do not completely value the need to educate this part is because of an assumption, which is probably a, you know, like a misinterpretation of a profound truth or a misapplication of a profound truth or even like a distortion of a profound truth is that assumption is that the aim in life is to be happy. This is sort of a misconception that most people have about uh, life and its aim. And in that sense, um, 
whatever the vital desires, whatever is my aspiration, my ambition, my uh, liking or disliking, I must act according to that. This tendency makes people less interested in valuing the need to control the vital, valuing the need to educate or train the vital. Now, this idea that the goal in life is to be happy or the aim in life is to be happy is to be understood as a somewhat of a perversion or distortion or misunderstanding or misapplication of a very high profound truth, which Sri Aurobindo and the mother constantly remind us of that the whole manifestation came out of Ananda, which is delight. And the purpose of life is to seek that delight, that delight of existence, that delight of being, that Ananda. But this is not a, uh, a sensory or, you know, a sensual or a hedonistic kind of pleasure or a hedonistic kind of happiness that we should be seeking. So this is one reason why we have not properly understood the need to educate the vital because we have been sort of uh, mesmerized by the perversion or distortion of the truth of seeking for ananda. And we have confused it with seeking for pleasure, seeking for happiness. Um, the second, the second uh, reason why vital education often gets um, sort of like not its full due is because one of the key aspects of vital education, because vital is the seat of all our likings, dislikes, uh, our uh, ambition, our pride, our desires, our will. Uh, it's also the seat of energy and enthusiasm. That's all the things that make our outer character, outer personality, that there is this, again, a misconception that has taken a human mind is whatever is the character we are born with, it cannot be changed. And that is what, sorry, um, uh, that that is what defines our being. Um, and Sri Aurobindo and the mother have spoken a lot about uh, uh, should I should I um, just should I can uh, Manish bhai, there is a disturbance there please uh, make sure uh, there should not be disturbance Okay, so um, yeah, so the the possibility that human character can be changed, can be transformed, is again something that we have to understand and appreciate, because only then we can totally, uh, we can completely understand the value that must be given to vital education. Um, this transformation of character or this development or changing of character is not something easy. That's where the role of aesthetic development or uh, an appreciation of art and beauty plays an important role. So this is why I wanted to kind of bring these two points out before we go into what is the role of art and beauty um, in vital education. So number one is that we have to understand that if the purpose of life is to seek the ananda, the delight of existence, the delight of being, the Indian thought process, the Indian uh, tradition has given a lot of thought to this, has given a lot of em emphasis on uh, coming up with various knowledge traditions as to how this ananda can be sought through whatever work, through whatever line of um, artistic, scientific, intellectual, uh, work that one may pursue. And the second is that there is uh, there is not only a possibility, but there is also a necessity to work on transforming one's vital, 
one's outer character, outer nature, to purify it so that it become a better and better instrument, a clear and clear reflection or expression of one's truest, inmost being, which is the psychic being. So I just wanted to kind of touch this briefly. Now, um, what is this thing about the Ananda? Let me begin with a short little um, anecdote from um, a conversation that Nirod Baran had once with Sri Aurobindo. Um, you know, Niroda was one of the closest uh, uh, disciples of Sri Aurobindo and also his scribe who, uh, you know, like who wrote uh, down as Sri Aurobindo was kind of receiving Savitri in the last few years um, of his physical um, presence in the, on the earth. So there was one time that, um, you know, and Sri Aurobindo's humor is well known how he used to all have all kinds of, you know, um, fun interactions with the few closest disciples that um, he, uh, he used to have conversations with. Um, and at one point, Niroda asked him that, from where do you get all this wonderful sense of humor with which you delight us so much? And Sri Aurobindo just gave a characteristic, simple, quiet smile and said, Raso Vahasa, verily all is delight. So I thought this would be a good starting point for us to explore the ananda, the beauty. So I'm just going to share a few pictures here, few slides to uh, emphasize this idea of beauty and art in vital education. So uh, I hope this is visible now. Verily, he is the delight. So this is what Indian um, tradition has spoken of, that supreme is essentially delight. And so the highest supreme, the highest conception that we have of the supreme being, the supreme consciousness in our culture is of Satchidananda, Satchit Ananda, consciousness, Sat is existence, Chit is consciousness and Ananda, bliss or delight. So beauty, as Dr. Kiran was saying uh, in the introductory um, words, beauty is nothing but Ananda that takes form on the physical plane, on, in the manifestation. But this beauty need not take a physical form in its, on its own. It could be, as she was reading out the passage from the mother, beauty could be beauty of sentiment, beauty of thought, beauty of action, beauty of movement, beauty in stillness, beauty of will. Everything can be approached with a sense of beauty. In the Indian tradition, uh, beauty is closely aligned with delight so, and harmony. These two aspects of beauty play an important role when we understand how beauty is understood in the uh, Indian tradition. And in fact, in Indian thought, the whole of manifestation is seen simply as a manifestation of beauty and expression of a beautiful dance of Shiva and Shakti. So uh, the whole creation comes out of a sense of an artistic and aesthetic um, delight. That is why the aesthetic feeling, aesthetic experience in Indian tradition is spoken of as the twin brother of the delight of Satchidananda. So the Brahman experience, the experience of merging with the Supreme, the experience of becoming one with the Supreme, that experience is considered similar to as the experience of a pure aesthetic delight. So it's called as the Brahmanan Sahodara. The aesthetic experience is the twin brother of the Brahman um, experience that a yogi, a sadhak can have. So this is the significance that Indian tradition gives on appreciation, on developing a sense of appreciation of beauty. This is one point that I wanted to bring up. Um, this is something that, you know, again, Dr. Kiran um, already reminded us 
that mother had emphasized so much on developing a sense of beauty that she even said, let this be our constant ideal. And how it connects with education, I will just uh, touch upon that um, in a few minutes. Now, just going back to the what Indian tradition has to say about the role of arts. Um, in fact, uh, Bhartri Hari had spoken of once that um, one who does not have an appreciation or even a basic general understanding or knowledge or a sense of um, appreciation for arts, sahitya, that is literature, music, sangeet, poetry. If one does not have an appreciation of these things, one is as good as an animal. But the animal, um, you know, the animal can be recognized, the beast can be recognized because of his its tail, an animal, a human being without an appreciation for art and poetry and beauty cannot be record, can be, cannot be called as a beast because he or she does not have a tail, but he's as good as an animal. The only consolation is that that animal-like man, that animal-like human does not eat grass, otherwise there wouldn't be enough grass left for the animals. So that was one of the Niti Shatakams, one of the um, aphorisms of Bhartri Hari. This is how much it was valued for all people, everyone to have some understanding, some appreciation for art and beauty in Indian tradition. Um, and certainly all arts were looked at as means to not only uh, provide entertainment or pleasure, but also a refinement um, of the outer uh, being, the outer nature, and certainly means of education as well. Uh, another key aspect of um, the Indian aesthetic tradition is that we did not understand arts, different art forms as separated from each other. So all the art forms were seen as part of um, the complete aesthetic tradition and all the arts were somewhat interconnected. That's why uh, when we, um, you know, like for example, when we go to some of the older temples in today, we see that they would also have a Natya Manda, uh, which is the place for performing arts. They would also have uh, on their walls, a lot of murals painted. So the painting tradition was also, the painting as an art form was also uh, considered an integral part of the entire artistic tradition. Certainly the sculpture and the architecture, they were, um, you know, they were naturally being expressed in a temple, the sculptural art, but other art forms, poetry, the sangeet, the instrumental music, all of those. In fact, there are a couple of stories um, that describe this interdependence of various art forms, particularly one story in Vishnu Dharmotara, which is an appendix to the Vishnu Puran, which speaks of how when a king goes to a rishi to learn about um, the art of making, um, he wants to learn how to make sculptures of deities of his particular Ishtadev, his chosen deity. And the rishi tells him, first he needs to go and learn the art of painting. And then he says, okay, teach me the art of painting. And then the rishi says, no, before you can learn the art of painting, you have to learn the art of dance. Um, okay, then teach me the art of dance, the king says. Before you can learn the art of dance, you must know the learn of, uh, you must learn the dance of instrumental music. The king tells, okay, teach me the art of instrumental music. And then the reply comes, but you first must know the art of singing. Sure, I will learn the art of singing first. But before that, you must have a well, you must have an appreciation or an understanding or knowledge of poetry, knowledge of prose. So the idea behind the story, the narration of the story was that one who wants to be accomplished in any art form must know enough of all other art forms to develop a complete holistic appreciation and a holistic um, understanding or knowledge of a particular art form. So this is the integral vision of art that is very unique to the Indian uh, tradition that we must keep in mind as we figure out ways on how to apply arts in our 
present day education system. Um, so then the question comes, why should we have, uh, why should we value arts in our education system? And how does art help in the transformation of character or in the development or training or education of that vital part of the being that we spoke about in the beginning? <clears throat> Just quick points. Uh, one is that art becomes a means that gives us a contemplative understanding of the reality. Uh, art is something that is suggestive in nature. It does not impose itself. It, it encourages a tendency <clears throat> in the being to understand or learn or know something through development of a sympathetic insight. Sri Aurobindo has used that phrase in his essays on national value of art. <clears throat> Incidentally, these three essays, uh, it's actually in six part essay he had written in Karmi Yogin on national value of art. And those are very essential reading for anyone who is looking at uh, how to uh, implement, how to apply a holistic art education program in uh, whichever level of education, whether it is at the school level or at college or university level. So he uses that phrase that art as a suggestive activity helps one develop a sympathetic insight because it encourages this um, practice of uh, identifying with the mind of the artist rather than through reading a long narrative description of what is being expressed. The person who is receiving, the person who is viewing at a particular art form, whether it is a performing art or a visual art, he or she tries to read into the mind of the artist to, in order to identify with that. The Indian tradition uses the word sahridaya, becoming of one heart, becoming of one mind. That is actually a yogic process in that sense. So art gives us a contemplative understanding of the reality of the existence. Art also allows us to be involved in whatever, let's say we are watching a drama or um, even movie, you know, movies are kind of like the modern day dramas in some sense. Um, we try, when we are in the middle of, uh, you know, a particular, watching a particular scene or a particular sequence in a movie or in a drama, we do get involved in the lives of the characters that is that are being played out and yet we are uninvolved. So it gives us enough of an opportunity to involve ourselves, but without really involving ourselves. So this Sri Aurobindo had spoken of as that what the, how it helps us is that art becomes a means to, for the heart to experience all the emotions, all the bhavas, you know, Indian tradition speaks of the eight, eight or nine rasas. If you count the Shant Rasa also, the nine Rasas, the Nava Rasas. So the heart begins to experience different Rasas, different moods, different emotions by experiencing, by witnessing whatever artistic product that is in front of us. Yet, if we can do it with somewhat of a detachment, somewhat of uninvolvement, the heart begins to grow through that experience. So it is that detached involvement that helps purify the heart, that helps purify the vital in us. So without experiencing directly, we could experience the rasa of the various emotions. And that detached experience helps, us, helps in purification. The other reason why art becomes important in vital education is that it helps us um, it's sort of like it's been spoken of as the layman's yoga for ultimate realization. Um, you know, often the method that is given by um, traditional approaches to purify the heart, to purify the vital is 
complete asceticism, complete rejection or complete suppression of all that the heart desires. So complete um, withdrawal from all pleasures of senses. This never works because suppression only works for a short period of time. Anything that you suppress comes back many, many times with a, you know, with a much greater vigor as, um, you know, as one is, one comes back out of that asceticism. That is why it's certainly in integral education or in integral yoga, this kind of asceticism is never um, considered as an acceptable or an, as, an, as a necessary way to uh, transform, one, transform one's outer nature. <clears throat> On the other hand, art becomes the means of like, you know, the bhoga uh, to enjoy whatever life has to offer, but also by that, because of that detached uh, involvement with it. So art becomes um, relevant in that sense, in that chit shuddhi. And I'll come to that in a little bit later with a little bit more detail. Art is not to be seen as a means to ensure or assure perfect individual or perfect society, though art can serve as a byproduct, art can serve these purposes also, because it can become a means to bring out some of the um, you know, some of the burning issues of our times. So um, in fact, when we look at Natya Shastra, we find that one of, the one of the goals that was given for drama in Natya Shastra was to educate the audience about the existing customs, existing practices, and also to, um, in a entertaining sort of way to Not working. What are some of the uh, you know practices that need to be rethought, uh, that need to be uh, you know thrown out? So joking, commenting on uh, the corruption of the times, commenting on if the king had done something wrong, talking about that in the form of a drama was one of the art forms, one of the particular dramatic forms that has been spoken of in Natishas. So art as a means to educate people about the existing issues of the times. That is also one of the purposes art can um, help us. Certainly it's lasting charm of life. I need, I don't, I need not say anything about that. Then um, the idea that I put there on all art is useless uh, from Oscar Wilde that one of the things why art often gets neglected in our education is because of this modern tendency of looking at education in a very utilitarian way. But art transcends all that utilitarianism. So in that sense, Oscar Wilde had made this funny remark in his preface to one of his novels that all art is essentially useless in the sense that we should not value art or not undervalue art because of our mind's limitation of looking at everything from a utilitarian point of view. There are things that are needed for human development, for human growth, human evolution, which should be looked at from outside of the utilitarian box. Sri Aurobindo, in those essays that I had mentioned, National Value of Art, had spoken of three specific purposes of art, aesthetic, educative, and spiritual. And it is this aesthetic role of art that becomes the key, um, key element for us to understand when we are trying to uh, examine the role of art in vital education. There, what is the aesthetic function of art? And I'm just very quickly going over that. One thing Sri Aurobindo spoke of, by the way, some of the um, art pictures that I have used are also indicative of the diversity of um, various visual arts that we see throughout India. So um, again, just to kind of emphasize the idea of diversity in um, artistic forms that we have in our culture. So one of the first functions in terms of aesthetic value of art or aesthetic role of art is 
that it helps purify, refines the outer behavior, the outer conduct. So it, it builds in a sense of um, somewhat of a repulsion or distaste for what is crude, what is rough, what is vulgar. Um, and the one who has been given enough exposure to what is beautiful, what is harmonious, what is refined, naturally does not want to behave in a way that is somewhat cru crude and coarse and vulgar. So the seeking for what is beautiful, what is decent, what is harmonious, it naturally creates an outer sense of beautiful outer behavior. The limitation of this is, or the danger or the obverse side of this is that it can also very quickly degenerate into this tendency that only the outer behavior is important. So we could be very, we could very quickly um, attach ourselves to the outer forms. So like table manners, for example, you know, just to behave, look good, to behave properly, you know, so the proper ladylike behavior or the proper gentlemanly like behavior. Um, so it can degenerate into just focusing on the outer conduct, the outer behavior. And yet Sri Aurobindo says, this is the first, this is the beginning of how human nature begins to throw off the yoke of animality from itself. So this is important in that sense. Um, but this is not the, all the aesthetic function that art fulfills. The second aspect, the second aesthetic function of art is that a sense of beauty, a sense of um, harmonious beauty aligns very naturally with a sense of what is virtuous, what is good. So that's why in India, we have this, uh, you know, this dictum of Satyam Shivam Sundaram, the Shivam and the Sundaram, what is good and what is beautiful. So the good and beauty, beautiful begin to somewhat naturally align themselves. Um, so our sense of virtue, our sense of purity is aligned, naturally aligned with what is beautiful, what is harmonious, and our sense of what is sinful, what is vice, is that what is ugly. Again, there is a limitation for this. This is why Sri Aurobindo becomes so relevant in understanding the role of art in vital education, because he'll tell you the limits of each function that art can provide. The limitation of this particular function of art becomes is that there is, you know, in its extreme, it becomes like um, all that is beautiful is good and all that is ugly is sinful, is vicious, is something to be rejected. So naturally, it, there, is, there is a danger of ethical pursuit of life and aesthetic pursuit of life coming into contradiction with each other. So the ethics that are concerned, concerned with what is right, what is good, begin to have a, some sort of a revolt or a protest against the aesthetic pursuit, which is the pursuit of beauty, the pursuit of what is harmonious and what is delightful. So the puritanism or the extreme revolt against beauty or the aesthetic culture, that is why we see a lot of, um, you know, um, like if I can use some current uh, examples, cultures, where there is a lot of uh, emphasis on what is considered good and right as per a certain literal understanding or a very narrow, limited understanding of what a particular religious scripture may say, they tend to ignore the aesthetic aspect of life. So they tend to undervalue all artistic expression so uh, you will see that in closed fundamentalist type of societies, there will be a um, revolt against, a protest against music, dance, art, all kinds of aesthetic expressions. So that is one danger where good is closely aligned with um, what is beautiful. So that could be the opposite side of that. 
um, Sri Aurobindo would want us to go beyond that. And what he would suggest or what he would emphasize is that the highest aesthetic function then art, that art can perform is the purification of the heart's emotions that I was mentioning a little while ago about for what, when we were discussing why art. Um, so art becomes a means to enjoy those heart's movements, all the feelings, emotions that the vital has in a somewhat of a detached and disinterested, uninvolved sort of way. This is where I think we have to study closely what Natya Shastra, our own dramatic tradition, which was the first, um, we can call it as the first or the primary text of aesthetics in Indian tradition, what that had to say about what was the role of drama. Again, I should emphasize, even though Natya Shastra gave Sikh primary importance to Natya, but it never undermined all other art forms. It said that Natya becomes, or the Natya, the drama becomes one art form in which all other art forms are naturally integrated. So the teachings, the, the insights that we get from Natya Shas are applicable to all art forms in that sense. One of the um, one of the things that we find in Natya Shast is that it said that the role of drama is not just to tell you about what life is at present, but also to give you an idealistic, to give the audiences an idealistic vision of life, what life can be. So in that sense, drama can become a source of enlightening or educating or elevating the audiences also, elevating them in their consciousness. This is what very interesting because in today's time, we see a lot of emphasis on realism in art, especially in modern cinema. Uh, we see a lot of emphasis on that cinema should portray what real life is. In India, we have always had this idea that the purpose of art should be to elevate people, the elevate the audience, elevate the rasik in their consciousness. And for that, they need to be given an image and vi a vision of how life can be made more beautiful, how life can become more fulfilling, how life can become more harmonious. So that is why there was so much emphasis on the neta, the hero in the story, the hero in our plot the storyline. So the ideal hero of a drama as per Natishtas should be one who should have all the ideal qualities. He should be generous, he should be brave, he should be well-educated, learned, firm-minded, intelligent, vigorous, enthusiastic, generous. You find this in all Indian tradition, whether it is the stories of, uh, you know, Ramayan, Mahabharat, Puranas, or the folk stories, um, you know, stories in Panch Tantra, the Niti Shastras, uh, all these kinds of things. So, you know, or the folk, the oral tales, the one who has all the higher or, or the good qualities of a human being, the higher qualities of what an ideal human being can be is ultimately the victorious at the end of the story. So this idealistic vision of art, is an important um, aspect when we have to look at how arts can be integrated into education process. Um, another aspect that we should, uh, I should quickly mention in terms when we are speaking of Natishas is that um, Natishas goes into details of what should be, what kind of training or preparation all the artists should go through. Um, whether they are actors, musicians, dancers in the drama or the director, the producers. And there is a lot of emphasis on developing inner qualities, developing qualities of calm, equanimity, um, you know, someone who will not get angry, someone who will be, who will have a good knowledge of the diversity of the customs, practices of the region, various regions of the country, one who has read the scriptures, one who has become a master of one's, one's senses, one who can 
who has mastered one's passions, one's anger, those kinds of things, those were considered important preparations for an actor, for a musician, for an artist. Similarly, when we look at some of the Shastras um, that we have in our uh, Indian painting tradition, for example, or in the Indian sculptural tradition, there is a lot of uh, emphasis on the artist, the painter, the sculptor, first going within, becoming a master of oneself, mastering, controlling one's passions, controlling one's vital, meditating on the image, on the vision, on the deity that one wants to paint, one wants to sculpt and express the vision that one has seen from inside out. So the process of creating art itself could be a means for chitta shuddhi, the purification of the heart's emotion. So Indian tradition had a lot to uh, say about the role of aesthetic value of art, both from the artist's point of view, the one who is creating the art, and also from the rasik's point of view, the one who is experiencing, enjoying the art. So if we can bring some of these things some of these ideas back into our education systems, that will be a great step forward. Um, just to kind of wind up uh, before we to leave so that we'll have some time for any questions. One of the things Sri Aurobindo talked about and both mother also talked about in her essays on vital education is that uh, these, this kind of exposure to art and beauty should be started off early on. Um, and as Sri Aurobindo said, that mind becomes profoundly influenced by what it sees. And he, at another place, he says that we cannot bring art galleries to every home. The least we can do is to create beautiful environment around the child, environment around ourselves. So everything that we bring in our homes, it need not be expensive. It need not be a designer, artistic, you know, some masterpiece of some... Uh, high paid artist, it could be simply a beautiful bunch of flowers. And as some of you may already know how mother emphasized so much on developing a sense of artistic aesthetic um, sense by working with nature, by working with flowers. So um, that I'm not going to go into more of that, but that's why both mother and Sri Aurobindo emphasized to create a beautiful environment, a harmonious environment around the learner, around the child, right from early on, so that everything from you know, the outer conduct, the outer habits, and the inner character is gradually trained to seek greater and greater sense of beauty and harmony and right order, just arrangement in the life as, we, as the child grows. So um, I think I'm just, uh, I don't know how we are doing in terms of time, should I stop here and see if there are any questions? Uh, I think uh, it's going well. Uh, you complete that because it's okay. very interesting and then we'll go for questions. Okay, please. Um, I think I want to just, uh, I've, I've kind of spoken of some of these things. I brought in some of these pictures in case there are some questions and uh, about some of these art because I kind of consciously put them there because like this particular painting. This is a very good example of how art can be a powerful stimulator of sympathetic insight. So this is a contemporary painter. So I just wanted to kind of through this example, um, just uh, demonstrate what we were just discussing. This is this, he's a Chennai based artist, Kesha Venkat Raghavan. And uh, in this painting, as I understand, he's demonstrating or he's expressing the meeting between Sugriv and Ram. So if we carefully look at the expression of Lakshman standing behind yeah. Ram, who is not, um, not too happy seeing that Sugriv isn't fully convinced that Ram can actually help, help me meet my objective, which was to kill Bali, if you know the story of Ramayan. Um, so Sugriv wants to kind of have a duel with Ram. Can you, are you really that strong that I have heard so much about? Can you really help me with killing of Bali? If you want my help to um, search for Sita, 
and Lakshman standing at the back is saying, hmm, he doesn't trust my brother. Who is he? You know, kind of like that. And at the feet of Ram is Hanuman, who has who is holding firmly to his feet because that is what Hanuman's character is. The Hanuman's persona is a complete surrender to Ram, a complete bhakta of Ram, who has no doubt that if there is Ram, everything is possible. Um, so the idea of a kind of like, you know, Sugreev, somewhat in a sense of some mild arrogance, getting into a duel with Ram, whereas Hanuman is completely surrendered. I kind of, that's how I see this particular, um, particular portrayal in this artist. And again, you know, Ram and Lakshman with overgrown beard and overgrown hair, which is not typically what we see in the more traditional portrayal of Ram and Lakshman during their one vast period. So here they are in a kind of a state of grief. Um, now that Sita is not with them and they are seeking help from Sugreen. So I thought this is a good example of how art can be a stimulator of that sympathetic insight. Art is suggestive. And when the intellect becomes, comes, develops this habit of reading into um, what the artist is trying to express, naturally the mind becomes more subtle. So this is what Sri Aurobindo speaks of as the educative role of art. But finally, Sri Aurobindo says the highest role that art can perform or the highest value of art is that it helps the humanity grow more and more towards the spiritual aim of life, which is not same as the religious pursuit or the religious seeking, but rather the aspiration, which is, which is it's the aspiration for divine knowledge, the higher knowledge of the self, who am I or what am I? What is the purpose of life? The higher love, the divine love, divine joy, divine delight, and the divine strength. And Sri Aurobindo has also spoken about, um, you know, the four powers of mother. One of those powers is the Mahalakshmi power. And that Mahalakshmi power, that Mahalakshmi aspect of the mother is closely aligned with this role of developing a sense of beauty because the sense of beauty is closely aligned with the sense of delight and sense of harmony and sense of the, the vibration of love. And where there is no beauty, again, it is not just an outer beauty, but the inner beauty of the being. There is no power of harmony. There is no, um, you cannot invoke Mahalakshmi, the power of Mahalakshmi. Mahalakshmi's presence will not be there where there is no vibration of harmony, love, and beauty. So in that sense also, the highest role that art can fulfill is to lead the being, to lead the human race towards that higher aspiration of divine love, divine beauty, and divine strength. So I think I'll just stop here. Um, and um, I could uh, just send you this uh, point. Um, uh, let me let me also one um, before I close this. Uh, let me just how do, okay. I stop the sharing here. Let me also mention just one quick thing, and then we can take some questions. At one place, mother had said that actually it is a weapon of the asura when a society or a culture shuns the seeking of true beauty. And uh, she said that it has been the ruin of India, Indian civilization, when we um, gave up a true seeking for true delight in beauty. So we have to bring that sense of beauty and harmony in life, in outer life and inner life, if we want to grow as a civilization and get back to the true sense of who we are as a civilization. Right. Thank, thank you, um, Beluji. It is amazing, you know, lecture uh, where you know you took us to journey of art, and uh, uh, it was it was like you literally transform <laughs> uh, through through your your talk. Thank you, thank you so much.